who is uh, going to speak to us today about Indigenous plant knowledge. I'll tell you more about her in a moment, but first of all, I would like to extend the regrets of Greg Sam, who was not able to be here with us today. And we're very fortunate that our uh, colleague and research associate, uh, Bill White, Halimuk uh, or Kasalit are his um, traditional names, has very kindly agreed to come and open our um, talk today with a song and a few words of welcome. So could I ask everybody to stand if you're able? Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. It's really, it's wonderful to be here, especially to welcome Dr. Packy Chips and our relatives, the Charleses from this territory. It's an honor to have you all here again. I have to tell you this one story before I, and that'll help you relax. <laughs> I have to tell you this. We, we were, uh, a group of us, when we were finishing up our degree at UVic, worked with a, a woman called, in our language, a, a siewa, a seer. In English, it's a seer. And we were talking to her. <laughs> we asked her about uh, headpieces, headdresses, because uh, as you know, various tribes throughout North America uh, use different kinds of headdresses. And so we asked her what the purpose of headdresses were. And she said, depending on the family and depending on the energy, depending on the teachings, the, the bottom line was she said that it helps the wearer channel information through the top of your top chakra. Your, your head, the chakra on the very top of your head. So it, it, it protects and it brings in a specific energy for that person if they have energy, if they have rituals, ceremonies, songs, teachings affiliated. It, it makes sure that, that if there are a hundred or so ancestors waiting, not all of them will speak. The only, only those that are associated with the piece that, that they're wearing. I thought that was very helpful. I'm going to, um, I'm, I normally, normally, when I've done this, we've, there's been, there's usually five of us, and uh, we accompanied uh, Dr. Samuel Sam for a while, and so I'm needing to move out of that space, uh, and, and knowing we have to work with those things that he left us. And so if I seem hesitant, that's, that's what it is, dear ones. Mm -hmm. I'm going to, um, sing a, a version of a prayer song, and then I might say a few words about uh, Tsitsawatl, and then, and then uh, my colleague and good friend will introduce Maki, Dr. Maki Chips. If you wouldn't mind going to that place, which for you is a place of real quiet, if you wouldn't mind closing your eyes and going into that place, which is a place of safety. This is the place where songs come from, this is the place where teachings come from, this is the place where great love exists, the love from our parents, the love from our grandparents, it's the love from our great-grandparents, etc. This is the place where healing comes from. This is the place where the old people told us that if you are quiet, if you are strong, if you are clean, this is the, this is the place where all those teachings come from.
finish this, we'd really like, the, like to thank the Creator for today. We'd like to thank the ancestors for the teachings, for the songs that they've held for us. We'd really like to ask the Creator and the ancestors to bring blessings upon our families, especially those children and the old people who require strength right now. We ask the great Creator and the ancestors to protect and to surround the families and to protect each of you as, as you continue your work with the community. I want to say a few words about Tsitsa Model and then I'll ask uh, my colleague Virginia uh, to introduce Dr. Becky Chips. Tsitsa Model, as we know, is, uh, speaks about helping one another, working with one another, being careful with one another. I, as I was coming down this morning, I was thinking of, of the degree to which change has occurred, forced change. I'm, I'm thinking of a bird in the Vinus transcript where they talked about what they learned from their parents and grandparents and from this part of the land and, and how they, they loved the old people. The old people talked many things about protection. Tsitsa Wattle is a reflection of the complexity of, of our traditions and culture. Even though there's been horrendous change, the old people's voices continue with being clean and being strong to make, make themselves known for a new time and a new place. And if we've learned anything from um, the, the wonderful work of, of the old man who's gone now, um, Samuel Sam, and the wonderful woman who's gone now, I can mention their names now because their memorials are finished. I'm thinking about Agnes Pierre. Both of them, and both of them, uh, really taught us about the importance of listening, the importance of helping others, and the importance of, especially the importance of songs, and prayers, and, and good words to strengthen everyone. That was one of their fundamental teachings about helping others and strengthening one another. Uh, they, they laid down the foundation for us, which was an amazing. We heard for all of the speakers who were part of Tito Wall that complexity of who we are and how we relate to each other in the world and the natural and supernatural world has come out with Tito Wall in various ways. And, and uh, as we continue this work, um, we'll be looking at different ways of, of making it come alive. It would be helpful if in the course of this presentation, as with the others, you begin asking yourselves, how, how uh, does this work within the community? How, how did this work with the people? How should this work with young people? How should this work with young people in terms of preparing a new generation of students who come through the system, including our own? How do we make it vibrant and alive once again? Or vibrant and alive as it always is? These are one of the uh, many truths that uh, flowed within all of the speakers who came through Tsitsa Wattle. And the challenge for us is to make those teachings much stronger with each, with each day. Uh, welcome to all of you for coming. Thank you for, for participating in Tsitsa Wattle. And, and uh, please think about these questions that we framed. And the Haddish white people really like the term objectives. <laughs> <laughs> Semology <laughs> 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 objectives. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to finish now and ask uh, Virginia to mm -hmm. continue with their introduction. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you so much, uh, Bill, for agreeing to um, create this space for us and to uh, protect us with your words and your song and your request to um, the Creator. I. Uh, very, very grateful to have our elders from Beecher Bay here, um, Bert and Lee, otherwise um, known, and the Charles family, which is such an important family in that area. Uh, I, I'd like us to practice saying Hem Himalach. Hem Himalach. Did we get that totally wrongly? No, that's okay. Hem Himalach. Hem Himalach. Hem Himalach. Hem Himalach. Okay, just a little practice every day. One of, and one of our purposes in strength, strengthening the teachings is uh, putting much more emphasis as we go forward on, he on hearing the language and seeing the language and getting that into some of our documents. So that will be coming, but I thought we should practice a little bit today. And uh, uh, Lee's uh, traditional name is Spacht. Spacht. 
tonight. Spot tonight. Spot tonight. Spot tonight. Spot tonight. Okay. Thank you, Scott, for uh, mm -hmm. letting us muck, muck that one up. <laughs> um, and we will be practicing. Um, I would now like to uh, just ask everybody to, to sit. And I'd like to just uh, give you a little um, brief overview of what is much more rich and diverse life than the little few paragraphs I have here. But uh, we've been very uh, um, excited about uh, welcoming Dr. Pat Chips uh, to our university here. Um, she's been here before in other guises, but we felt she would be an extremely interesting person to have for our Titsawana Speaker Series. Um, uh, Packet Chips has a BA and an MA and a PhD. She's uh, lived in the bush, she's lived up north, she's lived in a lot of places, and she's explored a very interdisciplinary path in her education, which uh, um, I love to see because uh, I have one myself, and uh, it's great to see that there's another very curious woman who's bringing together really different disciplines uh, around uh, the focal points that interest her in her life. Um, Papi was born, uh, uh, were you born in Greenland? I was born in Denmark. Denmark, right. But she's of uh, Danish and Elusa? No, my father's from Elusa, Greenland. Elusa, Greenland, yeah. 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 Um, uh, but she is a status member of Beecher Bay First Nation, has lived there for many years when she's not traveling. Um, her doctoral degree is in education and uh, education curriculum and instruction with a focus on cur curriculum development, educational technology, multimedia development, uh, and environmental studies, especially in the area, area of ethnobotany. Uh, she's taught environmental studies courses at UVic, and most recently, um, in terms of teaching, she's returned from two years of uh, doing uh, teaching work around food, food. In English. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, in uh, in Greenland. Uh, to date, uh, Peggy's uh, we've we've looked at her um, her presentation at, at great length, and I, I know what's in this today. She's going to be speaking about the, the history of plant medicine in her family, and how that may or may not apply to the knowledge carried by other families. Uh, she wants to show us uh, images of the plants and talk about some of their uses, both spiritually and physically. Um, she wants to discuss and share with us some of the problems around gathering food and, uh, and plant medicines. And um, also the issue of the uh, troubling prospect of loss of family knowledge. Um, I'm not sure, I'll ask Kathy once you get up here to let us know how much you want, want us to intervene as you're speaking. But for now, can I ask everybody to please give a warm welcome to Dr. Packet Chips. I haven't stood behind one of these before. so. I've been behind desks and stuff. No, okay. Uh, okay. So I also want to thank Bert Levina for being here. So it's basically about medicine plants. However, I want to give a disclaimer. As was already said, I didn't know it would be part of my bio, but I'm not a medicine person. I'm not a medicine woman. I've learned a lot of things about traditional medicine from uh, my, what would be my mother-in-law and father-in-law over the years. Um, but to me, they were my mom and dad because they were my family more long, longer than my real mother and father. Um, and Bert and Ivana have always been there to support me in everything I've tried to do. Um, so I'm not a medicine person. I am an ethnobotanist. Um, and I know quite a bit about medicine, but native medicine, but only from our family, only from what I've been told by our family and my family in Greenland. So I'm not, and I'm not, fr I'm not comfortable with giving out medicine information that's not already published somewhere, because a lot of it is private, confidential, belongs to the families. Um, Non-native medicine changed drastically at the time of contact or after the time of contact as people found out about the medicines of the First Nations where they arrived, primarily because they arrived sick and were treated. And medicine took a whole new leap and bounds to what we know today uh, to a very large extent based on First Nations medicine and medicinal knowledge. So, 
Um, my mother and father-in-law were, or mom and dad were, Gillette Chips and Sarah Sawyer. Gillette Chips of Didnat and Sarah Sawyer of B2B. Uh, so I think I've covered that. Can I just click? There. Okay. Um, so how does one become a medicine person? Quite often, traditionally, it would be someone who was, quite often it was someone chosen at birth. Occasionally, from what mom and dad said, it was something that if someone showed similarity to someone who was a medicine person in the family, they would quite often be steered that way. Um, but quite often it was at birth. Of course, residential school kind of destroyed that process. Um, medicine people did a lot of work. They, they worked in the, the big house. They worked in families. They worked, um, they helped with pretty much anything from counseling to healing to cleaning, cleansing, and very important people in, in society, in our societies. Um, quite often the, the male medicine people will work, at least in our family, will work with the men, and the female medicine person will work with the women. But it's not always. I mean, I remember Dad telling stories of him and Mom up in Cayuca. They delivered babies a lot for people, and I remember them telling about how they would had a little wood stove and they would get the temperatures right and keep pre premature babies there and help them survive. And so they worked with many things. Um, so. Um, some important things about uh, gathering and treating medicine. Medicine plants have to be treated with a lot of respect. And I was taught that you have to ask for the plant you need to help someone. You have to have the person you need to heal or want, wish to heal or help in your mind and in your heart. When you go out and you wait in the morning and when the sun comes out, It'll shine on exactly the plant that will heal that person. Um, but you have to know what plant. You can't sort of go out and say, oh, there's a whole bunch of medicine plants. I'll just pick those. Oh, and there's some other kinds. Yeah, I'll pick those. That's not really the proper way. It has to be very conscious and with a lot of respect. If you, I was taught if I, I drop a plant, a medicine plant, I have to burn it and send it back to the spirit of that plant. I'm not allowed to use it in the medicine because I've dishonored it. Um, but as I said, medicine is different for every family and it's a knowledge that belongs to each family. Um, so I'll move on. If there's anybody who has anything to say, please speak up, I don't mind. So I've been at Beecher Bay since 1976 and uh, Dad died in 1985, and Mom died in 2005. Uh, and then I learned a lot from Nancy Turner, of course, at, at UVic. Um, there's Gillette and Sarah. I think it's okay to show it now. So the first one is the Arbutus. I'm just going to turn the page. And it's called the changeable plant because of the way the bark changes. It goes, it's brown, then it turns red, then it turns green. Um, but the part of medicine is also things like spiritual and luck. And it was believed that, I was taught that if I touch it, then I'll lose my luck because it'll peel off me like the skin of the arbutus. And the chew leaves were chewed and the juice was swallowed for sore throat. But if you've ever chewed an arbutus leaf, you know that's really tough work. <laughs> but if you really have a sore throat, you, you can do that. Goat's beard. Goat's beard is usually really droopy. 
But I took a picture of this one because amongst all the droopy goat's beards, this one was standing like, yay, I'm alive. And it was just so beautiful. So I took that picture of that one. So remember, when you're looking for it, they don't usually look like that. They look like that. Uh, and it, its name means uh, herring eggs on bushes. And you can kind of see why. Because <laughs> before they blossom, don't you have all these little white buds all over it. The infusion of the roots was drunk as a purgative and used for high fevers and measles. Uh, urinary pain, tuberculosis, and spitting up blood. Um, most of this can be found in this book, written by Nancy Turner with my cousin, John Thomas, um, or our cousin, at the body of the Nidat Indians of Vancouver Island. Uh, it's getting quite old, and I've never been able to get a book copy of it, so that's, that's it. But it is available, I think, at UVic or online or somewhere, just to let you know that. The black cottonwood is used for, um, it's used a lot in salves, but salves can, if you want a salve or, you know, a cream to be really good, you need to let the plant sit in the oil for a long time to make different types of, of salves. Um, for wounds and cuts, and traditionally the fat around the stomach of a deer was used because it's such a fine quality. And in Greenland, all, strangely enough, the fat around the stomach of the reindeer is used as creamer for, for coffee. <laughs> so that's how fine it is. It's dried and then just used. So it's good for, for the skin. It's, it's way better for your skin than most of the things I've seen out there. No perfumes. But the black cottonwood buds contain an oil that's very important for, for healing and for, um, for your well-being as well. One of my favorite plants is the bladder rack. It, it was rub rubbed on the whaler's skin and on the canoe to bring good luck in whaling. But it also covers the, the smell of human, so it really helps in a lot of ways if you wash with it and stuff like that. Uh, it was used by pregnant mothers of unborn whaling hunters. It was rubbed all over the skin. And it's really easy. You open the little bladder that's sort of shaped like this, like a little wolf head or something, or bear head. And you, and inside is this clear liquid, and it works pretty much like liquid band-aid. So you can just rub it on any cut, and it'll just put this clear bandit on. The bunchberry. Um, I've heard many people talk about this one, but um, pretty well all of them also had uh, male babies, so even though they ate them, and I did too, so. <laughs> <laughs> but it's still there. If you want female babies, you eat bunchberries, but they. They actually taste really good if you catch them just at the right time. Otherwise, they're kind of dry and seedy. The cascara, a lot of people know the use of cascara because it's a common medicine now. Um, so it's, it, the in, an infusion of the bark was used as a, both as a, a little bit as a tonic. It depends how long you let the infusion sit, how strong it is. So if you wanted as a tonic, it would just be a little while. And if you want it to be an, an laxative, you let it sit a bit longer. Um, it's also used as a wash for sores, things like that. Devil's Club. I always wonder at the, eth at the ethnobotanist or botanist names for things. I just, like, they just didn't know the plants sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> Propanix horridus is, it's not a horrible plant, it's an amazing plant. And it's very beautiful. How much uh, the hike through a kilometer? Pardon me? How much you have to hike through a kilometer? Well, yeah, it's kind of thorny all over, but <laughs> <laughs> take another route. <laughs> uh, and if you had to, you could just rub up the the bar, the stem, and the thorns go. But anyway, the 
it's a very important plant for rheumatism and arthritis. Uh, the charcoal was used as protective face paint by dancers, and I wouldn't say that if it wasn't published. Um, I didn't actually think anybody would have told Nancy Turner that, but she did. They did. Uh, the barks are used as poultices and ointments, also for joints. Um, um, and in Greenland, no, Mom was always telling me that I had to use the berries from from Devil's Club so my hair wouldn't turn gray, and guess what I didn't do? <laughs> she was 77 and her hair was still black. <laughs> so, I can live with it. <laughs> the wild lily of the valley, um, I'm not sure why it's called the, the stolen plant. It could actually, and then that could also mean the slave plant, but I'm not really sure why it would be called it, so I don't know. But the leaves are really, really important. I um, had one student at UVic, we were out at a pit cook, and uh, we had a big fire going, and, and one of the students put his hand on one of the rocks, leaned on it, and got a really bad burn, like really serious burn. And I ran off and picked some of the wild lily of the valley and scrunched up the leaves and put all over it and, and he never he doesn't have any scars or he never got blisters even. Um, and I remember mom saying that when she was nine she got she was in the kitchen and a pot tipped over her and she was really badly burned all over and she was supposed to die but the family brought leaves and she didn't have that much scarring, and she did survive. But before I go any further, I'd like to just mention that it, one thing that's really important is that medicine people are expected to train for like two years or more until a medicine person feels that that person is ready, has the knowledge to carry it on. It's not, I've had a lot of people who said, oh, I went to this weekend with this and this person and now I know how to make medicine. Or I've had people go out and on plant walks with me and they've gone home and started making teas and I've had so much more than just taking a pill for a headache. Um, it's the whole person. And you can't learn it quickly. And if used without the proper knowledge, you really, plants are so, can be so toxic that they can really do a lot of damage. And you, nobody wants to do that, they want to help people, they don't want to hurt people. I have an example, there was a lady who attended one of my ethnobotany classes, and I found out shortly after that, she, she actually phoned me and said she'd made some tea and could she bring me over and a sample? And she was selling this tea. And so she came over and brought it, and I saw that there was trailing blackberry leaves in it, dr half dried. A lot of the Rose family, the leaves, when they're drying, become quite toxic with a type of cyanide. And many people don't know it. Trailing blackberry grows all year round, so we always use it fresh. She didn't know that. If she'd started selling that, she could have killed a lot of people. And she just didn't know. It looks so harmless, right? Um, so just a warning that this is not an instruction in becoming a medicine person. Okay, please take warning. Singing nettle has a lot of uses and a lot that I'm not going to mention. But it's used as a counter irritant. It takes your mind off things. For example, at home, Dad would always make us rub our hands with, with the leaves before going to the graveyard. And it keeps us here. It keeps us our feet on the ground. Um, it's also good for rheumatism and arthritis. And here it would be the, the branches would be beaten against the, the joints, and it actually does appear to make a huge difference. And that's not just taking 
one pain away and replacing it with another, it actually seems to do something there. Uh, also, it can it removes the scent of human for fishing gear, hunting gear, anything like that. Um, and it's actually a very important plant. Of course, so many people have destroyed it because it's a weed. And most of our medicine and food plants are weeds. And most of the introduced plants are not weed called weeds, but they really don't have a lot of uses. But anyway, Land Labrador tea, it's actually Latum Grandicum, and in Greenland, it's drunk like a zillion times a day. And there's a warning on, on it that you don't drink it too much because it does contain andro Andromeda toxin, which, if you drink too much, becomes harmful. It's quite a powerful toxin. But in Greenland, they drink it by, and I'm sure they, for generations, have drunk it by the bucketful. So I think they're pretty immune to it. Uh, but otherwise, it's OK if you drink you know, a cup of tea a day or every few days. Um, but I wouldn't drink it by the bucket. <laughs> uh, but it's really good for tiredness, uh, as a blood purifier for tuberculosis and after miscarriage. It helps to bring all the muscles back. And then in Greenland, it's used as a, as a very, made a strong tea out of it. And you use it as a hair rinse to get rid of dandruff and to make the hair strong if it's splitting. So, licorice fern um, is a really special plant. It contains inulin, which is probably the most important native sugar, source of sugar. It breaks down in, in lower in the system and doesn't affect or create diabetes and it can be used safely by people with diabetes. The rhizomes were chewed and swallowed. Quite often, because it's broken down further down your digestive tract, you drink water, and when it's in your mouth, it tastes like water, and as soon as you swallow, it becomes sweet from the licorice root, uh, or licorice fern root. But it's also, the juice is, chew is swallowed for coughs, colds, and tuberculosis and other respiratory ailments. It's actually quite good for that. The main thing with these is that they grow on rhizomes. I just probably already know what it is, but they're underground roots. So it's really important. <laughs> My ferns. It's really important not to pull one out if you're having one. Can't see that? Well, it's like that one works really well. fancy picture, right? <laughs> OK, fine. So the roots are here, right? And the rhizomes go for, to the next plant under the ground and usually on, on uh, big leaf maple trees and on rocks and amongst moss. And if you pull one up, you tend to pull up a whole series of roots and plants, so it's a really good idea to just cut on either side of a plant like that and then take the plant to get the root from it if you absolutely have to. But I've seen a lot of people, oh, licorice fern, yank. And there's like all the licorice fern gone from that spot. It's a little bit sad. Maidenhair fern is just becoming so scarce. The only place I can really find it readily is up at um, Port Renfrew in the cave across from the hotel. And even there, it's being damaged. They've planted this fantastic <coughs> uh, organic garden, or whatever it is, out in front with these terrible looking plants that look scary um, and that are spreading like wildfire. <coughs> but these are very special plants. They were primarily destroyed by the flower industry uh, because they have this long, black, narrow stem. And then these fronds kind of come off. And so they were used a lot in decorations around the flower, flower bouquets. And they've just about been wiped out. Uh, they're really hard to find now. Um, but they were rubbed on, um, might still be, I can't speak, 
on the rubbed on dancers' feet to make them light-footed. And a lot of this is not past tense, a lot of what I've said. Uh, the fronds are chewed for, as a remedy for stomach trouble, sore chests, and internal hemorrhaging. An infusion of leaves was used as a hair wash to rinse hair. Um, remember, if you have any questions, just speak up. Usually people are just pelting with questions. Okay. Oregon grape is, is both types. Um, they're used as a laxative, but I think the main use for it was that they're incredible yellow dye. They have the most beautiful yellow color under the bark and in the roots, but I've seen some Oregon grape growing now up in Souk and places like that. They're, they've got to be on steroids. I mean, I've never seen any plants that look like that, but they're definitely Oregon grape. It's just, they're humongous and they have like grape clusters, like big grape clusters. And I don't quite know what they're doing with them, but I don't quite recognize them as the native plant whatever it is they're doing with them. And also the, the grapes on the, on the original Oregon grape actually taste pretty good sour. But on the introduced plants, or whatever kind of plants they are, they, they really don't taste good. They're very, very, they taste like you shouldn't have eaten it. <laughs> Probably. It's very intriguing. <laughs> Our stories also belong to families, and uh, so unless it's published, I don't usually tell them. Okay. Sorry. The red alder is also another amazing tree. It's a really good way to check and see if the water is going to be good. It tends to grow where there's been bad water or uh, stale water. Um, but it's a, a water purifier, so when it's growing and they're older, you know that the water is probably going to be pretty, pretty safe. Um, it's used for so many things. Um, the infusion, uh, oh yeah, and there's a three, three bark medicine, the red alder, hemlock, and fir. It's used for TB and other longer ailments, very important medicine. But please don't play with it because um, you have to get the quantities and everything just perfect or you hurt people. Um, it's also drunk against internal injuries, bro broken bones and bruises, um, poultice for severe back. And when you cut a little slice of the bark off, if it's the right kind, if it's actually a red, red, uh, red alder, and put it in water, the water will turn pink and you know it's the red alder, and that is really good for a mouth, uh, mouthwash if people have sores. Remember when my mother was dying of cancer, I made it for her because she got a lot of sores in her mouth from the medicine, and it relieved it quite a bit. Um, and it's also used as an eye wash. Western red cedar had a million wonderful uses but it, it can contaminate water, causing diarrhea. And not everybody is affected by it, but it can. Uh, the br branches were rubbed on the young people as they were training for adulthood. It would go from soft, softer leaves to harder in order to be strong enough to survive being out in a canoe for a long time or being in the water. Um, if the plants are from the wild or whether they've been planted and grown or cultivated? Does it matter? Well, I think one of the biggest things is if the environment has been left, has been looked after traditionally. Because, for example, we've got, we've got camas that we're growing in, in a sort of garden to plant them out because they've been disappearing. And we've got camas that's growing in the wild and they're about the same size. But I know that Cheryl Bryce from Songhees um, was allowed to burn a patch on one of the islands and planted the camas in there. And instead of the bulbs being this big, they were as big as a regular onion. 
and that would be the traditional, you know, looking after the land traditionally and looking after the plants traditionally makes a, a huge difference. But now they're, they're, most plants are being so threatened by introduced plants that they're just barely squeaking by and they're not as strong as they were. And when I grow plants in the garden, I usually plant them back out to try to bring them back in the, in the wild, rather than growing them in the garden to, to pick from there. Is, is that close? <laughs> is that okay? <laughs> okay. In, in this book, the ethnobotany from of the Nidnat Indians, John Thomas has given a lot of names for uh, plants. And here it was called Hlipat. Uh, pat and apt, or pt, was used to signify a, a specific type of plant. And Hli is usually used for something really flexible. And a plant, is a, a snake is a Hli e, so there was no definition of it, so I just put question snake plant. Um, So, in order to, if you want your first child to be male, you can eat four leaves. You have four leaves each. The leaves were chewed when you're out in the bush to alleviate hunger. Dancers chew the leaves to give them a good performance and as a blood and general tonic. Um, on the other hand, I know I have a lot of our a lot of the kids, and even myself, we were told not to eat, eat them. Uh, so I'm not, Dad never really gave a reason, but he just said we're not supposed to just eat everything. We're supposed to be careful what we eat. But we all eat the berries anyway. A skunk cabbage, uh, it's named Tibut, and it's, a lot of people have gotten rid of them because they don't like the smell. I think the smell is kind of cool, but, um, and the plant is so beautiful. But the leaves were used as a poultice because it's, on the, oversi on the upper side, it's completely waterproof. And on the underside, um, it's got medicinal, medicinal qualities. So it can be used as a poultice for severe burns. It also protects the burn, right, from water and anything else. The chewed, chewed roots um, were known to cause abortion. The wormed leaves were placed on the chest for pain and the decoction of the root was drunk as a blood purifier. Um, Mom showed us how to make, she said that in, if it was really, really muddy and rocky and they had to walk, they would make temporary shoes out of skunk cabbage leaves. And she showed us how to make them and they were really cool. They, they thought, they got Nike beat all the pieces. <laughs> <laughs> and they're also used for wrapping up food to put in the pit cook and to line the pit cook. The trillium is, to, said, to is said to cause fog when you pick it. Um, usually we don't pick it, but it's getting hard to find too. Sometimes you find it and it's sort of a purpley pink color and sometimes it's white. They can be side by side. It's not age, it's just the difference in the soil they're growing out of. They're the same plant. Western it's hot ham... The blossom, right? Like the, the blossom comes out white and then fades to pink. Sometimes, yeah. But sometimes they just fade to brown. And sometimes they come out white and turn pink right away and stay pink and, as a full blossom. And it's totally like you can have them same age side by side and one will be pink and the other will be white. Same as uh, with the red flowering currant. You can find a bush with all white flowers and next to it, we have one down at the Learning Center, right next to it is a red one. And, and all the flowers are pink and dark pink. And again, it's soil quality, not the type. Whereas with the fawn lily, the pink fawn lily, which grows out toward, more toward Port Renfrew, Jordan River, um, whereas the white one grows here, they're two different types, so even though they're the same kind of color change. So red 
um, again, it was part of that three bark tea um, infusion for internal injuries. But and you could put the powdered bark into your hair to eliminate lice. The bark was used as a poultice on sores that wouldn't heal, and the chewed part bark was used as a poultice to on cuts to stop bleeding. There are a lot of plants that do that, so you kind of use. Depending on how quickly you need something, you use the plant that's most appropriate to that. The yarrow is one that I've been... I found a lot of the Indian carrots, but I've also found a lot of the Queen and Anne's lace taking the place of the yarrow out on Beecher Bay. So I've been growing huge hummocks of yarrow, and then I split them apart, and I can plant them out so that we can get yarrow back. Uh, it's a very, very important plant. It's called white spot plant because some people, when they touch it, get white spots on their hands. The leaves are chewed and swallowed as a tonic. The leaves are chewed or the decoction is dunk, drunk for colds, coughs, TB, and other respiratory ailments. And it's a childbirth medicine. Um, it can be used for sunburn, but I guess if you get white spots, you don't want to use it for that. But um, it's also a really beautiful, graceful, amazing plant. The leaves are just like the softest feathers. Pearling Af Everlasting, I wasn't going to put it in here, but it, it had a use, especially with people who were ill, or um, it, it was used because it, it's an everlasting flower. It, it just dries, and it looks exactly like it did when it was alive or damp, moist. <laughs> but it was, it was powdered, and the powder was kind of like talcum was used. It, it makes the skin soft. But it's really, really helpful for people who are old or ill and who need to be picked up or moved. It helps them not get bruises and, and keeps them comfortable. Um, and a lot of young girls would, would bathe and, and then rub it on their skin to keep their skin beautiful. Kinnikinnik is kind of cool, too. Kinnikinnik is... Um, the leaves were smoked like tobacco. Later on, they became a tobacco substitute. They were not the original tobacco. tobacco. There was actually a native tobacco. Just like the tobacco plant that's growing now, it was, but it's completely extinct. It was pretty much wiped out immediately when people came in contact with it. Um, but the leaves are also chewed for a sore throat. But one thing I found with kinnikinnik that's, and not the kind that's growing down here because it's got all kinds of chemicals on it, I think. But um, in nature, it will actually expand out over the ground when, it's, when a mild winter is coming, and it'll so you can almost get a gauge of what winter is going to be, how cold winter is going to be from looking at them. When it's going to, before the, what was it, 2006, that big winter, we had no power repeatedly, forever, uh, and it was really cold. That, that fall, I noticed that the, the kitty king that was all over the ground was right down to the base plant, the, the original plant. Hmm? <laughs> they're actually not too bad, <laughs> but they're not everywhere, so <laughs> bring out your coats. <laughs> but another one, Arbutus, I should have mentioned when I was talking about the Arbutus, is that the Arbutus has the incredible ability to sort of decide that, okay, this, like, what plants and animals know what winter, seem to know what winter's going to be like. When, it, when a really bad winter's coming, all the rats are trying to get into houses, right? <laughs> and, um, the Arbutus, it can just decide that this branch and this branch is going to be a problem if the wind, there's going to be high winds, it's going to damage me, so I'm just going to wipe it out. It's going to cut off circulation. And it turns black. And before the 2006 storm, I was actually going around worrying what kind of disease has hit all our Arbutus because of so many, all the berries were black, the flowers were black, the branches were black on just so many branches on so many Arbutus trees that it was scary. And then I saw the branches that got knocked off 
than the spring and during the winter. And I've noticed that you can kind of look at them and see how windy it's going to be, but it's all local, right? It wouldn't be for southern Vancouver Island forecast for the winter. It wouldn't work, right? So uh, I like that one. Okay, so my reference is personal knowledge, um, again, from this book. You can find a lot more in here. Uh, there's another one that used some of the information from another book by Harry Kuhnlein and Nancy Turner, uh, Aboriginal plant used in Canada's Northwest Boreal Forest. Doesn't quite apply to here, but the same, a lot of the same plants are in here. And it actually gives the food values and, and much more information about the toxins, which is really good to know. And then this, I have it here. And I'm not finished, but. Could you read that? <laughs> okay, temazart.com is a website, and um, you can go there and pick up a free copy of the ethnobotany book I wrote. It's for this area. It's got little walks. It doesn't cost anything. I'm not trying to get rich or anything. It's just. I wrote it to be used, and I'd like it to be used, and somebody, a publisher offered to publish it, but they didn't want the color in it, so I said, forget it. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just giving it away. <laughs> okay, so some of the problems of gathering medicine and food plants today, you probably know some of them, but they're, they're actually uh, quite a few problems. Uh, a lot of the locations where traditional and hereditary plants uh, were grown or used to be gathered have been destroyed. Uh, a lot of it has been destroyed and other things have been planted. Um, a lot of the lands were taken over by people and fences were put up and it's not accessible. Um, and. Also because we live on reserves now. But traditionally, of course, First Nations did not live on reserves in villages. And you lived in the village in the wintertime and people went to their hereditary grounds for berry picking. And so people would spread out and intermingle with other people with hereditary rights to the same place. And it meant that you weren't depleting the plants and animals or fish around your winter village where if hunger struck, if, if it's a disaster struck and you didn't have enough food, there would at least be a food supply. But also because you, you don't want to really just clean out a whole area. So this way, not too much was gathered. And as part of gathering, you also looked after plants. Um, and suddenly being on reserves, people weren't allowed to do that. And sort of, Oh no no! You can't just move over. You can't just move over to a farm over in in uh, Washington State, or because um, it's private property. You can't just move over there. You have to have your passport and all kinds of other things. Um, difficulty in traveling. A lot of villages were along the coast. Are along the coast, and it was really relatively easy to get from one village to the other by canoe. You, know, you try and do that in, the, in a car sometimes, and you have to drive up the east coast of the island, drive all the way in, and then you have to drive all the way in to, back to the east coast and back over to the west coast to get to the next village, which took like 15, 20 minutes to get to by canoe. Um, introduced plants are a huge problem. Um, and I'm not sure what to do about them, but I wish that you know, maybe some of the plant nurseries would stop bringing in introduced plants so that people had a choice of native plants and that are amazingly beautiful, keep the wildlife coming, uh, the birds coming, don't have to worry about watering them because they can survive. They're used to the climate. 
Well, there are some places that have and some native plant nurseries, but you have to be really careful. Some of them just go out and grab it from nature, and they're not helping. Right. And especially with some of the more rare plants, when they if you've got to somehow find out if they're uh, if they're growing it, reproducing it, and selling the reprodu reproduction, uh, because you just can't have people going out and grabbing rare plants to sell. But, you know, if everybody started doing it, then it would be a lot better. I got an example, I, I phoned up highways and I said, look, you keep, this is just after they finished Veterans Way and put the speed signs up, right? And I phoned and I said, why on earth are you planting grass along that road and saying we can go 60? You're planting a banquet on both sides of the road and they speed. You know, it's, the deer are going to come, they're going to be crossing the road. That's insanity. And it's, un, it's dangerous for the deer and for people and cars and whatever. But I said, why aren't you planting native plants? Because none of the types they use are native. Well, that's too expensive. And I said, well, when you look at the damage that's being done, it generally might not come out of your pocket, but it's costing a lot of money. Nope, nope, too expensive. So the grasses they use come from Europe, Asia, and it's a mixture, and uh, Eurasia. So a lot, of, a lot of them just don't even come from around here, the grasses they're spraying, and the flowers aren't. But I really, it really hurts to see that it would take so little determination to turn things around. Uh, like just start. We went to my chosen fair yesterday, my chosen day. I was walking by these people selling plants, and I'm looking at them. <laughs> Not one, well, there was one, Morley Milne, had native plants, but they were selling the most incredible looking plants, but they were definitely not from here. And, and it would just be so helpful if people would just stop <laughs> planting all these strange things. Um, the, there's a lady up the road from us, we called her the donkey lady. Um, she brought gorse in because she said that was the traditional fencing for donkeys in Scotland. And I wondered how long they'd had traditional donkeys in Scotland. <laughs> but that's what she said, and she insisted that that had to grow there, but it spread. And I mean, even when it's this big, it's super prickly. They like, try and pick one up out of the ground. And it just sprouts, and just, it's horrible stuff. It doesn't belong here. Um, Department of National Fence likes it though because it's, they don't need to put fences up. <laughs> uh, so laws against traditional burning, they're starting to figure it out now that they have all the big summer fires constantly. Um, but traditional burning ensured that it was really cool because it was creating a balance. When you traditionally burn an area, you, you're getting rid of invasive species. You're getting rid of a lot of the larvae um, of, of insects that harm plants. So you're controlling it. You're not getting rid of them. There's no need to. They're part of the balance. But you're keeping it under control. You're also creating a habitat for new fresh reeds to grow at the edge of lakes, rivers, uh, grasses, and bushes, the trees aren't hurt when they're the native trees. They don't get hurt by it. And you get these berry bushes growing in profusion and more grassy areas. And you get more deer and you get more bear and you get more rabbit and whatever. And you get healthier water for the salmon. And what you're doing is when, the, when nature is bountiful, the animals will have more babies. So if you take some deer, you're not throwing off the balance because you've actually helped to create an environment where they can have more. And we're not being allowed to do that. And uh, it would really help us protect our native plants. But um, a lot of younger people don't have the time or knowledge. They have to go to school or they get taken away. Um, and then after that, they have to try to find a job, look after families. Um, and like we've started gathering um, basket grass and cedar bark for elders that weave 
and distributing it because they, they were complaining that their sons or whatever were working in some other in town and didn't have the time. And then in time, some of them couldn't remember exactly where it used to be. And there were traditional gathering places, but a lot of people who worked in it had their own personal, like that had been handed down for weaving grass, for basket grass and stuff like that. And when they don't use it and they don't pass it down, then it's, it's forgotten. And some elders remember the medicine, but not the plant. I was up in Cayuca and they were telling me about a plant they remembered. They'd really like to find again to make medicine. And they were describing it, describing it, and what it did. And finally I realized it was the Devil's Club. So I scouted around and found where they were growing and told them. And they went, we went and looked at it and that was it. And they were really happy. So reconnecting. And then not everybody was taught about medicines. And I'll get into that even more on the next one. And the problem is of, <laughs> let's go here. All right. The problems of family knowledge loss. Uh, elders, are, a lot of elders are dying without passing on the knowledge. And it's not the elders' fault at all. The residential schools did so much harm in telling people if you pass knowledge on, if you teach your kids the language, if you teach them anything, you're hurting them. And that was a trauma that has been so strong. And I'm glad to see that a lot of people now, older people now, are starting to get over it and defying it. But it was like put right into the, the backbone. I mean, it was just pushed in so hard and all the other trauma that came with it. And the separation, you know, the loss of book people, the loss of passing on knowledge to the, to people who were point, picked out at, at birth or to your children. Um, when children were gone in school, you can't pass it on. When they come back confused, who am I? It's hard to teach it on. Um, traditional ways of to choosing apprentices isn't working because we, we can't pick out somebody at birth really and say, okay, you're going to be this or you're going to be that. And they're going to be going to school and they're going to be doing things. And for, I think a lot of young people would love to learn some of the traditional things. I think it's starting to become really and has been really important, but they don't know how to ask, and they don't often don't ask. And traditionally, the elders aren't supposed to ask, may I teach you, or say, I'm going to teach you. Although, um, I know up in Cayuca that was a problem, because I spoke with them, some of the elders, about, well, why don't you just pick somebody? And so now what we've started doing when we give out the basket grass is we give basket grass to the elder, and then we give them some extra and say, this is to the person you teach. Um, but there's just a, a, a missing, a tiny bit missing there between people asking to teach someone and young people asking to learn. And then, of course, finding the time and the means. If the schools would start allowing students credits, like giving them a day at home on the reserve or two days, to learn cultural things that would make a huge difference, I think. Language loss, the names of plants, they just tell you so much about what that plant is and what it does. I can use an example I, I told, <laughs> told Bert last night. Um, the, the word for dog in Nidnet is chikwa. It's like this. <laughs> and it's probably an A. But with Nidnet, it's kind of funny. Because um, it it's a strangled A because of the. It's probably more sclerotalized than Nidka. But anyway, it, when the linguists come out and say, okay, what's that mean? Oh, dog. Okay. So now that word means dog. 
road on the pay, uh, forward right behind you because the wind is shining right on there. I can't oh, is it? see what you see where that was. Here? Was on, yeah. Okay, sorry. Okay, I'll get it the other way. Or, or the L, R, L, whichever. So it's it equals. That just means dog. So everybody says, okay, dog, fine. But there's a different word for dogs in Nutkan and Maka. And what they're missing is that the actual meaning of it is that it is to cut nose. And it means that it was from when dogs went into the food boxes where food was stored, their noses were cut, so they would learn not to do that. And so the word actually means cut nose. And we know that's a dog, but it tells so much more than just a dog. It tells something cultural. It, it contains an valuable information that just doesn't happen with this. And it's the same with the plants and in the language, the names of the plants. And some, the different parts of the plants have different names, and they all have meaning. And so the loss of language is, is terrible. It's an ancient, ancient language, much older than English, and it shouldn't be killed by English. Um, not to insult anybody who's a natural-born English speaker, but English is more like a trade language. It doesn't. It's actually so new that it deals mostly, if you notice the language deals mostly with trade. Mm -hmm. There's a zillion words for trade, for different variations of bartering and selling and buying. Very little for emotions. You take French, there are like a zillion nuances of words for, for feelings. And a lot of the older languages, there's so many shades of the same thing. And there are words for them and people understand the feeling of that word. It's not there in English, so it's just being wiped out, all these beautiful shades of the language. And then, of course, in 1955, or oh, when this, the ceremonies were forbidden, that was way longer, earlier than that, they were brought back in 50, allowed again in 55, I believe. And there was this mad rush for everything. First Nations that could be sold to the highest bidder. And with the ceremonies being forbidden, the, it had to go underground. And to some extent, it was kept alive, but it's not the same as when you can practice openly. And people went to jail, and a lot of people went to jail. And it was a long time we weren't allowed to practice, and medicine is part of it. And medicine people were hiding out. Um, and, but it's possible with people like Bert and Levine and Bill are all working so hard to try and connect to the youth and bring some of that knowledge back as much as possible. And that's invaluable. Any questions? Oh, yeah. Beautiful. Thank you. Thanks. I do that too. I doodle a, okay. doodle a bit. Wonderful. You have a hand just for this part. Kathy <laughs> Bunny, um, thank you so much for. If there are any uh, questions, Jenny, I'm happy to. Beautiful images, all of this information. I know that people um, who usually come in the circle, we tend to be a little bit informal. And so uh, I just invite you to come and sit back at the table. Yeah, let's talk and let's, let's raise some questions. And I would uh, we'll we'll love to hear from uh, Bert and Levina if anything, as Patty said, uh, tweet some memories of yours in your families. And uh, why don't we just open it up? One question that I have is, um, like I have young daughters, 10 and 5, 
And I think they would be really interested in this kind of knowledge. How would a person like me connect that with somebody? Um, I do a lot of plant walks. Like this summer I did a whole lot of plant walks with Count Sunderberg. Um, different age groups and with the train, the, uh, the counselors at first. And I do go up to schools. I, I do ask for gas money because mm -hmm. um, pension is kind of rough. <laughs> Paying for gas nowadays. So are you interested in going to school? I do. I, oh, I have several schools I go to. When, you know. If I could talk to my daughter's school, then they would be really open to it. Sure. Yeah. And we actually have a little. Part that perhaps you could take them for a walk nearby? I don't know if it's got native plants in it. I don't mm -hmm. know. It works. Right. Uh, yeah. They usually find some place close by. It's near Blankensop Lake. Hmm? It's near Blankensop Lake. Oh, it might be okay. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I, I do, because I think it's so important to connect the children of anybody to, this, to the, where they are. And, and because like I like to teach some of the people who move to the subdivisions out here, close to the reserve and, and uh, nearby, be, or anybody really, because if they feel connected to the land, if people feel connected to where they are, they're going to help us protect it. Mm -hmm. And they'll protect us. Become forest hunters. <laughs> yeah, but there's so much more than that. I mean, <laughs> just, you know, you, you fall in love with an area. This is, this is the area I... I feel closest to things and somebody wants to put a subdivision, well, maybe it won't happen. Because maybe several people have that, or a lot of people feel strongly about that. I could ask their schools? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll get back to you. Okay. Um, can you go back to the previous question that you had in relation to where do you, how would you come about getting native plants? How, how, would you go, how would you go about it, like, for the average person? You don't know where to well, start. if you've got a computer and use the internet, that's a good place to start. Yeah. And then it's a, it's a good idea to just, you can actually email people and talk to them and ask them the hours they're open. Some places, uh, the nursery, down there, <laughs> oh, yeah, down. Yeah. 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 <laughs> that one. I'm lost. Anyway. Um, okay, that way. Um, they're not bad. They don't have a huge choice, but they do have some. And if people buy them more, and they're not just going out and gathering them. I know that because I was, we've dealt with them for a few years. And they're getting them. They have, they have some native... They have an area with native oh, plants. If people cool. go and buy them, they'll bring in more. Mm -hmm. Do they have meadow fern? Who? Meadow fern. You said the, that is becoming very yeah. maiden. Maiden fern. Oh, maiden fern. I don't know. It's so beautiful. I know. Yeah. But it has to have, like, you basically, pretty much have to build a, a little shelter with water running or a lot of water around water? it. They seem to do really well in there. <coughs> You can find them up island too in some of the bigger parks, but usually it's really moist areas. But it's best not to take them because they're disappearing. Mm -hmm. But don't forget, they, they drop a lot of spores. So if you want to, you could go out with an envelope and tap a few into an envelope. Right. It wouldn't hurt the, the plant. Mm -hmm. And if it grows somewhere else now instead, then they, they would be happy. Have you seen maiden fern here on the grounds of uh, Royal Roads? No. No. It doesn't mean it's not here, but yeah. I haven't seen any place that usually would grow it either. Like with that moist darkness that they seem to prefer. Becky, you told me something um, when we were speaking at your home where you uh, how she provided this amazing um, spread for us, uh, for Greg and I. Uh, Dana, can you pick some berries that day? and? Um, so good, and we're in this beautiful spot. You were telling us about how the plants often protect themselves. Oh yeah, yeah. You want to talk, tell the group about that a little bit, and where you've noticed that, or how you've noticed noticed that showing up. Well, 
Actually, a lot of the introduced plants do too. They, they will actually excrete a toxin into the ground and keep other plants from living there, from growing there. But also, like when a tree or a bush, like the oak tree or willow tree feels threatened, it will plant a million babies, uh, or maple, big leaf maples. Uh, it, you'll just see all these shoots coming out of the ground, just like all over the place. And with the willows, if they feel threatened, branches grow out of everywhere. You know, just new branches just grow out of every branch. Bigger than twigs, but... And, and they're just... They know that they're endangered, so they try to make sure that they, they keep going. But the, a lot of the... It's so important to try to keep the oak, the Gary oak, in this area, because they're being... A lot of, like I have absolutely nothing against the Douglas fir, it's an amazing tree, but it is, if, it grow, if there's an oak tree, there will be one growing right on top of it almost, and struggling for the shade, and quite often the oak loses, and I think if we lose that, we'll lose the Gary Oak habitat that, that enables us to have camas. And we want to bring the camas back. Like we don't pick the camas now because there's so few. I love the taste of camas, but I won't pick them. Um, but it would. We lived on that a lot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But we need to bring them back the way they used to be. But I remember there was that one year where we. Where some of the younger people went over and cut down a lot of the broom on number two reserve. And the next spring, camas grew. And they just sit there and wait for the opportunity. And that was awesome. I made them really happy. There's lots more broom over there. We've got to get them going. <laughs> the broom is so beautiful. Yeah. You know, for someone who's just moved here only two years ago and moved in the summer or late spring, and Glorious yellow. Oh, oh gorgeous. yeah. But I mean, I wouldn't even mind if they planted that along the side of the road because the deer really don't like the like mm -hmm. room. They really don't like it. And then if we could all just keep it down, which is kind of difficult. But I find the best way to get rid of broom is to plant something native that will shade it. I hate shade. And that's a nice, productive way to, to get rid of them. They'll just dry up. This too that it's it's here, but it's going to have a certain time life cycle, and then it's going to to be gone. But how much is going to be gone with it by then? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm not going to wait. <laughs> Sorry. That, yeah, you know how some insects have their, their peak in it. Yeah, they put in those horrible pink and and. Sort of off gray, sort of gray black. They look like a moth, or the heads don't look like a butterfly. They come out in the daytime. They're brought in to eradicate tansy. They were, they were actually an engineered bug that was dropped on us without our consent. It was bought from the States for millions of dollars. But anyway, and the government forgot to tell us, but it was dropped, and they're not eating the tansy. When you go look, there are no caterpillars on the tansy. The first year I saw caterpillars on the tansy. The second year I saw fewer. Now I don't find any on the tansy. The tansy's doing fine. Uh, the butterfly's still around, and I do not know what it's doing. Yeah. I haven't figured out where it's laying eggs, but there are not as many around as there were. So maybe that was just a failed experiment, but it would be nice if they talked to us first about stuff like that. They're actually super toxic, those things. If a cat eats them or a bird, really toxic. The bugs? Mm. Yeah. The tansy is toxic too, so. Because they feed on them, they're toxic. <coughs> but if they start eating something that's not so toxic, they won't be toxic. But I don't know what they're eating. 
Sorry. Um, you've probably seen the renovated boathouse that's going to be uh, elaborated or Not really. I yeah. saw it when it was just being built, but yeah. just from the outside. It's not, it's not open yet. They're still waiting for, um, I think there's a fire hydrant that needs to go in and we'll <laughs> call the needs or something like that. And also, there's no more like, phones in or ability to, you know, do a, a presentation like mm -hmm. this yet. So it's not really open, open yet. But at some point, it, it will be hopefully soon. And uh, we can have events such as this here. Mm -hmm. One of the things that people talked about, uh, many people, some people in this room and a couple of other people, that there's a garden here on campus. Oh, I know, I talked to him. You, John? Yeah. 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 Talked about, and as well as Tim Brigham, who is here, um, about you know ideas around a native plant garden. Yeah, that would be awesome. Which would be really nice. Uh, yeah, to but I think we should involve all the elders from all around the, here. Yeah. In that as well. And that's part of the. I think part of the question, like, you know, I guess there's a couple of questions like we have to get money to do it, <laughs> and as usual. Or get gas cards. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> or or get gas cards. Yeah. And um, as well as uh, you know, the university get. Being able to say, okay, go ahead and see what we can do. But just any preliminary thoughts on kind of, we're right, it's right by the water. Mm -hmm. And what would go there? It's a bird sanctuary, too. So yeah. Sanctuary. So a weed's at the edge, of course. Weeds, yeah. yeah. All the different berries, sink foil. Um, yeah. Little streams, so some of the ferns. Did you say Devil's Club needs running water too? It needs semi-shade. It, it, it can't have full sunlight. At least it doesn't grow anywhere I've seen where it's full sunlight. Is, is there any way we could use part of the forest too? In the first instance, um, I was thinking about, I'm, I'm sure we could, it's a matter of, I shouldn't say it like that. I'm sure we could explore it. <laughs> well, our gardener, John, isn't, he isn't here to sort of answer more definitively. But um, I think that if we could get a project going and get funding and gas cards and so on, we could help make it happen. Mm -hmm. And it also was, you know, it's a good project for uh, a sponsor because it's so, it's such a tangible thing, right? I mean, we get, um, a local business or company to say, look, I'll you know, put up the money that we would take to do something like that and keep it going too, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Yeah. It'd be great to get some youth involved too, this. Yeah. Well, even as tunes from here to well, the youth from the research. Anyway. <coughs> well, I was thinking too, kids from um, the language classes you're teaching or maybe one or two kids from each of the, the bands around here who could sort of have a little bit of ownership over one of the species or some I taught, aspect. I taught a course at Ubik, uh, one of them. Uh, <coughs> and they were supposed to learn about, we could use the plant garden up there, the student's garden. And so we, we talked about it and decided to build boxes. And they had to study the different types of soil for the different types of plants, native plants and then plant them in these boxes and donate the boxes to the uh, daycare centers and schools of the reserves nearby. And then okay, came and nice. picked them up and then that way, we've actually got two of them because there wasn't one at the time we got them. Nice. But I know Saanich, several places in Saanich got it and got boxes. They're, they're big growing boxes. Like you can put a cover over in the spring okay. if need be, but they're native plants, so they're okay. And uh, that way it can become part of the teaching and, and you have the plants. Not only do you pick them and teach about the plants, but you eat them and use them and teach the use of it. So that's a really good way to get um, stuff like that happening. There's a uh, major kindergarten. Uh, this band, 
to bring the kids on in the mornings. Mm. And you could probably uh, do something <coughs> Can I tell them who you are? Huh? To me? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've known Mary. <laughs> I've known Mary a long time. Because uh, I used to work, when I went to, I went to York University for my MA, and I worked for Mary for a long time. Years and years. <laughs> we go way back. Yeah. <laughs> and has in, anybody who's been in my office and seen this beautiful print, uh, that's Packy's oh. gift to me. Mm. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> You're welcome. <coughs> Happy teaching. Thank you. I have one question. Um, any mushrooms? To my knowledge, the dad said they were never really used traditionally because there were other foods and they were so risky. I think some, some fungus was used, like some were used for different things, uh, okay. ceremonial, um, sometimes for the shelf fun fun fungus. It, it, I would, if I'm out camping or something, I'll cut a chunk out, if I'm, especially if I'm near a, a swamp. I cut a chunk off and light it. It just, and for a couple hours, it keeps all the bugs out. And then after that, I'm out too. Because, <laughs> I mean, this works. <laughs> but, uh, no. I personally prefer to use vanilla leaf. It gets rid of bugs too. It doesn't get rid of me. <laughs> There's no need to. There's so many other foods, and it was so. Some of them were so toxic. Yeah. Would you use um, say bird if you were out in the bush? Would mushrooms help you figure out what was going on with what direction you were facing, or like where would mush mushrooms show show up in your lives? A real damp areas. Um, there's a lot that grow right around our house there, but we've never ever thought of eating them or anything because we don't know. Um, you have a specific place you have to bring them to find out if they're toxic. Mm -hmm. And I don't know where that is. Mm -hmm. They're not really part of the culture. Yeah, interesting. Mm -hmm. I think culture is developed around necessity. talking about the reservations being limited for gathering the medicine and herbs. Is there any interest or opportunity to have protected areas if you find somewhere that a plant is growing well that you use and need and it's a valuable plant? Is there any way to protect it? I think you I talked a lot about Fort Grand Cru. And then I don't know. We tried. We tried with Western Forest products yeah. to protect the bogs up in, up in the top. And they, we went around and put up the pink and blue ribbons all over. And now it belongs to Petita, but they've given us permission to keep using it, which is awesome. Um, but there are other places like, there's a type of basket grass, the three-corner grass, which is really nice in basketry. It's, it's, it's the, the foundation of the baskets. It makes the plant, helps the plant, or the baskets be waterproof, extremely light, and extremely, for the original purpose, protective of anything inside the basket. It's now a lot of times cedars being, cedar bark's being used. It doesn't quite have the same protective quality or lightness or what. So the, I know of one area and it, it's on the, because it grows in the tide, tide area. And so it looks like tall reeds growing out of the grass, out of the sand. And it's on private, I don't know. I didn't think there was private property on beaches, but I guess there is because this man let us use it, but he's old. And when he goes, he's... We don't know if we can go back there and get more. Otherwise, I found some on the west coast of the island, but you'd have to travel a long time to get to, there, to that spot. And it would be risky. So, but I think there are ways of trying to bring things back. Um, for example, I did find out that if the seeds are planted in a in the in a pool, like if you make a pool close to the, really close to the ocean, like on a on a hill maybe, 
as long as they get the, ocean, the sea spray, they will grow. Because I was out looking at a pond that somebody wanted to figure out what plants to put in, and it was growing there, and it had the sea spray coming in. And I'd never seen it growing other than on a beach. It was tidal water, but there was enough salt coming in, I guess, too. So, I mean, I always thought it would be cool to, for any reserves that, that would like to have it, to, to make some of these pools and try to see if we can't grow it so that all reserves have their own supply of the, and can help it grow back, come back so we can have it to use. Uh, Bert and Lee, could I ask you about the, um, uh, told me at one time you were doing summer camps for kids on, on the reserve? No, did it have anything to do with learning the plants? No. No. No, it's, uh, the, the summer camp that Bert started was mainly for uh, drug, and, drug and alcohol prevention for the youth. Mm -hmm. And um, we had it for two weeks every year. Well, we used to, but we don't anymore. Mm -hmm. Would we camp out in the bush? Was no, by the water. By the water. Mm -hmm. We camp out. Okay. And um, when we did have it, um, there were no TVs, no radios, no, no phones. No phones. No cell yeah. connection. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, because they had to concentrate on what we were trying to teach and what other elders were trying to teach. Because we invited elders from other um, communities to come. I remember I took them for plant walks and stuff like yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. I was just thinking how cool it would to be to spend a couple of weeks learning how to make your skunk cabbage shoes and, you know, um, receiving a little bit of that uh, knowledge to see if you were one of those kids who was turned on by what yeah. you were learning. Strange enough, a lot of the kids are, like even when they go to schools, they don't have it. It's not part of their, it's not quite off of their ancestry, but when they start out, they sort of beating the plants and picking things off, and breaking, not really thinking about it. And mm -hmm. Then as we walk and I talk to them, and I, I tend to, when I see a, one of the young people really get interested in a plant, I make that child a, a protector, a guardian of that plant. And so making enough guardians of the di all the different plants is, I'm sure they'll carry that with them all their lives and maybe pass it on. And I think that makes them feel good and they feel really connected to it. Dead craft, uh, making a craft like, um, yeah, that's it. Like, uh, dream catchers mm -hmm. and feeding mm -hmm. and uh, different stuff like um, we had, uh, May, Sam, and them come out and uh, so with, we're inviting people with different knowledge. And, uh, and Bert and I taught cultural, or cultural and traditional ways and um, how to better themselves in their life, um, to set themselves a goal, um, you know, not, not far over, but okay, maybe, maybe set a goal for next year, and then next year, and then next year, and just um, not to put it out so far that it becomes unreachable right. and frustrating or anything, just maybe whatever suits the person, mm -hmm. maybe one month at a time or, you know, every two weeks or whatever suits the person to set their goals and what, what they're going to accomplish at that time. And, um, and we had a lot of um, people coming there talking about alcohol and drugs, and we even involved the people from um, William Head Prison to come there and talk to the youth of how they ended up in there and um, what caused it, which was mainly drugs and booze. And, um, it was really good for the kids, mm -hmm. and they, they really miss it. It's just not happening right now. I wonder, um, I believe that, is there any garden in the door? 
It's just it's such a, I remember the day I learned to garden, I decided I was going to garden at age 30. I was really struggling in my life. I hit fourth year of university, so enough said. <laughs> and um, I was in Vancouver as a Calgary girl. You could never garden in February, but all the plants were, all the invasive plants were being offered at Safeways. And I just found it so meditative, you know, to uh, take, I, I had an apartment, so I didn't have a garden, but I had 10 pots. And I made these beautiful flower sculptures the first year. I didn't plant any food, um, except there was cat mint in there. I guess I could probably have eaten that maybe some geranium tea. But wow, it's, it, was, uh, it was like dancing or something. It, took, it totally took me out of my, out of my busy monkey mind. And, uh, I really loved the smell of dirt and fish fertilizer in my hands. Um, I started reading about organic gardening and then I learned that soil was actually this complex organism. It wasn't just dirt. Um, and, uh, I don't know, I just felt like it was one of the most healing things I've ever done in my life for myself was to even just at that very urban level, right? And, and, and all just about horticulture, not about healing or anything like that. Um, I, I found it to be a, um, a wonderful hobby. Uh, somebody came and stole one of my pots one day. I mean, but it was Mother's Day and I thought, okay. Okay. <laughs> Obviously, somebody was really getting in trouble if they didn't pick up the new <laughs> But that's how good those plants make me feel. And I didn't want to, like, just, you know, sock it to that, who that named this person. So. so I think it must be very beautiful to work work in the ways that you do. And uh, I know you love your greenhouse, you know, all the plants. Uh, that yarrow is just um, burgeoning. No, I've got to plant it out this year. Yeah, yeah, and I love the idea of, uh, you know, an Occupy movement, for instance, that's all about planting the yarrow back or uh, doing that sort of thing on, on more of a mass or neighborhood level, right, and getting everybody involved on, on being guardians for some of these things that we didn't even know how to see before someone like you came along and shared that knowledge with us, because many of our mothers and aunties and fathers never got this teaching, and of course, you cut it off at, at that level and it doesn't go any further. And I think many of us have been uh, um, doing terrible things to the soil and choosing plants that are harmful because we just don't know. And, uh, I'm really, really grateful that you just came and gave us this little glimpse into a, a world that I'm sure a person could spend their whole life learning only to learn that you have so much more to learn. Mm, that's the best part of learning. And I think it must be very beautiful too when you're working with the plants and being with them, to th that you're always thinking about your, your mom and your dad and the people that raised you and taught this to you, to feel connected to a whole line of people who make well, knowledge possible. I wouldn't really have done anything if it hadn't been for the others. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, so it's just that whole, whole other envelope of meaning around all of this that I think makes um, this a very special presentation because it is local to here and to the people who belong to this land. And we would not be getting this if we were at uh, Harvard or UCLA or Oxford University, because it doesn't belong there. And uh, this is what I'm discovering about indigeneity is, to me, one of its great beauties and great attractions is how it, it, it asks me and forces me to wake up and notice the uniqueness of this place and to um, to really appreciate being alive and being in a body on rock and soil with a certain kind of sky and light that nobody else in the world is really experiencing. And then when I do that, um, the world opens up even farther because I, I have this remarkable opportunity to, um, to learn more and more about the place because of generous people like our elders who come and share and our cultural specialists and leaders who are coming to share. And um, while I'm an avid reader and I've always loved books, I'm not, I don't find that stuff in the books. So I say mm hajjka -hmm. to you. And hajjka to the elders who have come. And so we're uh, really creating a space for this to be a normal and natural thing that we do at Royal Worlds. Uh, helping us feel like we have permission to ask really silly questions. Um, and, 
and to be part of a group who's doing this together, so we're not in this alone. It's lovely to see you. Mm -hmm. It's been a long time, and Sherry, and Darlene, and of course, and Rebecca, you haven't been for a while, have you? No. No? No. no. But it's so great when people can come. It's Royal Roads, and we know that time is very of the essence. So to have so many people here today is great. Uh, we know that people who cannot be here will be able to view all of this thanks to our media uh, people. And uh, uh, we'll make sure that we uh, do another transcript, pull out some of the, the priceless gifts in that, and share it with everybody who cannot be here today. And behind the scenes, I want you all to know that I am uh, working with Mary and people in the Office of Research and colleagues who are really closely involved in Sitsawatl to um, think about really creative and useful ways of uh, uh, getting some of this knowledge that we've gathered, that we've been lucky enough to gather now for the last year and a half or so, and putting it into some formats that other people who, who can't be at Royal Roads uh, uh, could use. Um, and we may be calling on you and all of you out there in TV land um, to help us test some of the products and the uh, learning resources that we're going to be creating. That takes a while. Uh, we have lots of other responsibilities as we go along, but that's, there's something deepening and quickening in Season Waffle, and I wanted you to know that, uh, that we're working behind the scenes to, to grow this um, more and more. I think uh, we should uh, close still. It's 2 o'clock and people need to get back to their <coughs> agendas and their people, their students, their families, their doggies, their gardens. Gardens. <laughs> <laughs> and dogs and grandchildren. And dogs and grandchildren, yeah. Um, but I wonder if we could close with, uh, do you have anything you'd like to say to close? Is there a closing song? Or perhaps Bert or Lee have something they would like to say? We, we enjoyed um, listening to um, all um, about the plants there. I, and um, like it said, there we've forgotten a lot. Like um, those what's up there now, I only know them as tiger lilies. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I've forgotten the name of it um, in, in uh, the First Nation language. Um, it's, it's like I said before that as a young girl, I was a really confused girl, just both Bert and I. Because at home we were told how important culture and tradition is and we went to school and we were told that it was a sin and it was wrong and it was devil worshipping and all that. You know, so we grew up confused. And um, we did forget a lot of the good stuff that were being taught to us by our elders. Because we didn't really know where we were, who we were, what, what our entity was. And it wasn't until well, lately, they've started to revive all of the things that they stepped on a long time ago. And um, where we're teaching our children some of the things that we remember as, um, as young children, we remember things that we were taught. And um, it's sad that we had to forget it, but it, it just happened. But I'm really glad that Patty came um, with the, with this plant stuff because it's really important. Mm -hmm. I I do know some medicines, but I don't know the English name. Um, I only know them to see them. I have to go look for them and see them, but I don't know their English names. Hi. Mm -hmm. So I'd just like to thank Patrick for the presentation. That was very interesting to me because, like my wife says, we forgot a lot of our teachings from our elders. And watching those uh, pictures of the plants coming up there kind of brought some of my memory back of uh, what I was taught as a young boy growing up with my grandparents. But I wasn't. As a boy, I was, I was never taught anything about medicines. I was taught to be a hunter, bring food to the table. That was my job when I was growing up. So I want to thank Packy for what she has done to me. That's great.
I just want to, uh, I really want to thank Aki for this, this amazing yeah, presentation, <laughs> this very complex presentation that, that brought real excitement in terms of the degree to which uh, I was reminded that, you know, the old people never stood on the shore waiting for pharmacists and doctors. They <laughs> understood what to do with themselves. And, and I'm, I, um, I'm always just amazed at how much she knows and how humble she is. Um, our own people who go through academics tend not to be that humble. And so I really want to thank her for holding on to that and, and also mentioning who your teachers were. Uh, that's so important. As you were talking, I, I want to close with this one story, uh, again about the Siawa, the seer. Just before, about a small group of us who were in school, our third, fourth year at Cubic, um, we were working with the Siawa, the seer. And she, just before, uh, on the uh, overpass that goes towards uh, uh, Saanich, towards Uvic, you know, that overpass, the, I forgot the name of that. It's the, um, anyway, there is a huge uh, apartment complex just to the right of that overpass. A realtor had called uh, Lynn, is her name, Lynn Henry, had called her. And the realtor wanted her as a medicine person, as a Siawa, uh, to go and check out what is wrong because the apartment wouldn't sell. Of all of the others, the apartment wouldn't sell. And it was cold. And so she called uh, Lynn, Lynn and her husband went and they phoned and said, it, as she always said it this way, uh, she said, it has to do with your people, you have to come. And so I went with her. Anyway, the short version is, is, is she, she walked on the land and uh, her and her husband and, she, and what she said was, the, this is the short version, she said, this, all the field here is where the women used to bring the young women to teach them about what berries to pick, what plants to pick. This is where they used to bring them. And, but because they were taken away by the residential school, they weren't able to pass along that knowledge. And she said, for that reason, uh, there's still a void. And she said, in spirit, all of those uh, old women, groups of 10 of, their, 10 of them at least, we're walking, waiting to pass along this knowledge. What you're doing is, is really important then. You're gathering knowledge to present to a new generation. That's how important your work is, is what I'm thinking about. And I was talking with her, and, and I said, um, well, can you talk to them? And she said, yes. And I said, well, you know, all of these uh, old women, and I say that with great honor, all of these old women who are looking for places to teach, um, I said, if you spoke to them, could you, uh, could you ask them to go to the reserves where the people are, their energy, and, and just go to where the people live today to help move that energy along? And she said, yes, I can do that. And uh, so she did that. And I think it, um, uh, it's, it's an amazing mix. When, when we had that experience, I remembered uh, Chief Seattle in 1855 at the end of his speech. He said, there is no death, only a change of worlds. And that, that was very, very true. Um, I, I, I'm going to close, and I just want to thank you very much for this amazing, amazing knowledge that you're holding and, and bringing out again. Thank you. And thank you, Virginia and Greg, for this amazing uh, setting that you're allowing for, again, new energy to come forward, new teachings to come forward for another time. Thank you. Okay.